intriguing and interesting, but I also want to learn from y'all. So uh, hopefully it'll be interactive. And what, how many of you were there last night? I know you were there. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, Camille. So, and yeah, so we're going to do more of that participatory work, just FYI. And I know we don't have a ton of time, so um, I'll try to pace it properly, but I can't promise anything. Um, so in a nutshell, one of the things I do is deploy these four methodologies to help people solve problems. And I know that there's a lot to unpack in there, but ultimately they're interactive and kind of multi-sensory, and they engage learners in ways that are outside of your typical auditory um, and kind of linear thinking. And I am the innovator in residence at Mural, and that happened accidentally. So before, when we were doing uh, game facilitation on site, it was very analog. And I obviously the pandemic changed that circumstance. So we had to learn how to adapt these to virtual environments. And I suspect that will be interesting for y'all. Some of you are most of you, what's happening in y'all's situation? Is it hybrid? Is it virtual? Is it in, on, in the classroom still? Yeah. All of yeah. the above? <laughs> yeah, cool. So we can talk about what that looks like and how that works, you know, because we're still testing. I mean, it's just, you know, it's kind of mayhem. But um, so the reason that I find those methods useful is because we have problems, you know, <laughs> like society is facing some really difficult challenges. And so <clears throat> just if you categorize problems, and I know there's a lot of language up here. So if you want to just take these in for a second, these definitions. And I think if given the opportunity, we could identify very easily a lot of these happening in our lives and in our institutions and in our world. And so interestingly, um, there's some real great allies for solving these problems. And I know it sounds silly and we're gonna talk about that too, but doodling is one of those major cognitive allies. How many of you, I heard that Drea. Thank you. <laughs> Drea makes an entrance. Um, how many of you are doodlers, just out of curiosity, like how many of you use visual language kind of in a rudimentary way? Yeah, cool. So we'll find out. We'll find out how far we can take you today. Um, and then the other one is what I call collaborative intelligence. So these two things are really potent allies for digging into problems, mapping problems, starting to figure out where the leverage points are, and solving them with other human beings. Because collective thinking and collective intelligence is going to um, be required, I think, for solving some of the really the big, hairy, audacious challenges that we have. So I know, what do you all think doodling is? Like, what did, what did you grow up thinking it was? Markings on a paper. Uh-huh. That's better. That's better than some of the definitions I heard. <laughs> what else? It, yeah. Cure for boredom. A cure for boredom? Nice. So you went to art school. For sure. She's, she, knows, she knows the secret. Yeah. So most people, and even now, well, Roy, you have an idea. Oh. <laughs> it's meditative for me. So. Yes. Perfect. What about you? You said something. You raised your hand. Uh, it's, it's what you do when you're in a lecture or meeting and you kind of like, yeah. Uh-huh. It's bored, but just right. you need to occupy. Yeah. So it's a universal language, and typically when students do it in classrooms, they don't get applauded for it, right? And so I spent many years, weirdly, investigating that as a natural function of human beings and discovered that this is an appropriate definition, which is that people are actually using it to support their cognitive process and that once you allow it, there's many, many ways that you can, there's many places you can take it, right? So it can look like this. This is just like an example of an abstract doodle. And I was digging into um, presidential history and some of our favorite people, and as it turns out, they're also all doodlers. And when you find their journals and their notes, you can identify that this is a thinking companion consistently across history. Um, and I have another more sophisticated version of doodling, which is when you integrate words and data and numbers and shapes and so forth, and I call that info doodling. And I use that language on purpose because there's millions of doodlers around the world and there's billions throughout history. And so what I noticed when I was saying, that if I use the word sketching or drawing, it was very off-putting for people, including myself, actually. And so, but when I use, which doodling has its own, you know, muckery. I'm not saying it was like a, like a quick land, but it was an entry point for a lot of people and people have a connection to it. So there is a more sophisticated version of it, which is called info doodling. And it looks like that. And also, I suspect some of you will have seen mind maps, you know, so it's just a way to unpack something and understand it relationally. And here's another example. And these are all real examples from real people thinking through real things. So it can, I mean, they have um, their uniqueness is abounds. This is me working on an event. So I'll use like multi, multi-faceted materials like index cards and sticky notes. That's analog. 
And this is somebody at Citrix working through a customer journey. So there's like truly nothing that you cannot visualize. There's no system or process or problem that cannot be externalized and visualized. And then also, just for like credibility, there's a lot of <laughs> um, scientists, I've noticed, your wife is a scientist, I've noticed that they are consistently reliant on visual thinking. Um, Richard Feynman actually used to refer to his, um, his thinking around physics as scientific doodling. Because it was him like allowing himself to sort of play with all these landscapes using visual language in order to get to a problem, um, to solving a problem. So it matters. It matters significantly. And, 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 I, and I know that from direct experience, and there's more and more research coming out now, but um, I have been teaching it around the world, and I have no doubt in my mind um, how important it is as a literacy and how much it augments learning. It doesn't matter if you're, quote, creative or if you're an artistic type person. It's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with it. it what, ha what matters is that you actually get permission and a little bit of training, and then you start to apply it to your direct context. That's what makes a difference. So it does all these wonderful things, and I can go on. I did write a book about it, so. <laughs> but I gave them all away last night, so I don't have any more. So now you have to buy them. That's horrible for me. Yeah. So it does like some very profound uh, metacognitive moves for people. Okay. And also, I meant to ask, like, are y'all competitive with Harvard? Like, what's the vibe on that? Because <laughs> I realized they're older, and I was like, oh, I wonder how they feel about each other. I mean, this is, you know, um, this is from the, their educational institute. I was like, I shouldn't, I don't know what's appropriate. Um, but so these are some of their thinking moves. And so info doodling actually empowers and supports all these thinking moves. So a lot of times when I'm trying to identify how to approach a problem, I'll figure out what thinking move do people need to make, and then I'll give them some kind of visual architecture or a thought experiment in order to probe that question, right? <clears throat> and so I wanted you all to see what it could look like in a classroom. And probably some of you have seen these things or do these things. So I would love to hear any of your experiences. But um, these are you know, real groups working on real things together. And it's actually joyful and engaging once we get we soften some of the resistance to it. These are people all doing system and process mapping inside of a software company. These are people at South by Southwest building robots and uh, socializing their experiences there. And these are people at Zappos um, they were trying to figure out how to serve their customers better because they're already exceptionally good at it. So it's actually hard to innovate because <coughs> they're already really good at it. And so those, that's the, sort of like the summation of doodling. And then the other piece earlier at the beginning when I was talking about how you tackle complex or complicated or chaotic problems, the other piece is this collaborative intelligence piece. So working um, skillfully with other human beings in order to figure out how to approach something. And this is one of my favorite images for it. Have y'all ever seen human pyramids? <clears throat> like it is so, it's almost tear jerking watching them do it because they're so connected to each other. They're so present to each other. They're in danger together and they are competing with other teams. But it's like, it's like, it's like a small artistic representation of the best of what we can do in like in a symbolic form. And so this attitude of mutual success is huge. It's so big. And there is, um, I was talking about this last night, there's sort of a hangover, not sort of, there is a hangover in our society and many cultures around the world where our goal is to be the individual star and to sort of one up other people and we're very competitive, which is awesome and useful, but we also need to be able to do what I call code switching, which is learning how to be collaborative. So you can be skillful at your own work, but also want other people to be skillful at their own work. And I have um, watched how challenging that is inside of corporations mostly, but um, it's something that if you're gonna unlock collaborative intelligence as a skill, you do actually start to understand mutuality. You have to start understanding mutuality and how to soften that experience and to connect with others. And be happy, there's a concept called sympathetic joy. So to be happy when they're happy, right, for them. So it's not a zero sum game. But these are the other pieces of collaborative intelligence that I want to, um, to talk about. And ultimately, we're going to activate them. So how are you all doing right now? Am I talking too fast? I had a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> good. Y'all are tracking. We got some smart people, so you're good. 
Okay, so here's the heart. Here's the like the secret of it. Because I, when you look at collaboration, it can get very heady. And at the end of the day, you can distill it to these three qualities. And y'all heard these last night. So curiosity. So coming back to not knowing, which is hard for us to do because we're smart and educated and we have goals and roles and responsibilities and people need us to know <clears throat> and we need to know. So to be, it's vulner there's vulnerability in not knowing in holding space and just being curious and interested. But it is the, um, it's like quintessential for collaboration. And so is turn taking. So they have evaluated uh, low performing and high performing teams. And by they, I mean Google, because they have massive amounts of teams. And so they did 180, they studied 180 of their teams. And then they, they um, integrated a double blind study with 250 other teams. And what they discovered is that if you have teams where uh, one or two people are dominating, that ultimately the collective intelligence of the team will decline. So you have to make room for other people. And not in a, like a, a lip service kind of way, in a genuine way, where you're like truly related, connected, interested in their insights, even if they're quiet or they're not assertive or they don't fit the traditional model, you have to make room for people at the table in order to get the best outcomes. And you would be surprised at how challenging that often can be for people that are coming out of industrial era hangover. Um, oops. Um, and then yes and. Have y'all took improv ever? Any of you took improv? Yeah. It's so fun, right? I mean, it's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but it's super fun when you get like past the, when you let go a little, yes, then it's really pleasurable. But so this is a state, it's like, it's an energetic state where you're allowing, and we did a little bit of it last night. How, so people that were there last night, how was it to just let other people's ideas come into the matrix? Was it, you were probably fine with it. You start giggling so hard that I was like, she's having the greatest time of her life. Yeah, you were okay. Was it hard for others? Y'all are having happy memories, I see yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> right, well you know like people that want to control and predict, it was just understandable impulse. Like it can be very hard to just accept something and go okay and then carry it, it's super challenging. But uh, it's essential for good collaboration, saying like yes, I hear you. It doesn't mean you're saying I agree with you. It doesn't mean you're saying I have no opinion of my own. It doesn't mean you're permissive. It means it's, you're not a yes person. You're saying like, oh, that's a possibly interesting phenomenon. Thank you for bringing it to us. I'm going to see what I can do with it and then go with it, right? So it's a whole different way of, of conducting ourselves. And it's essential for collaboration. Because what happens is, if these three things are in place, then these two phenomena occur. And so the game we're going to play, and I refer to them as games. I, um, it's from one of my books. They're <coughs> thought experiments. They're visual thinking thought experiments. But the game we're going to play is intended to activate those three things as best we can. You don't have to be flawless at this, and in fact, it's better when we stumble, because when systems break down, that's actually how you know that they, they work or don't work. So it's, function, it's good to um, be uncomfortable and to be like bad at something. How many of you enjoy being bad at something? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's not common for us to be like, yay, that was terrible. But it's really, um, it's very, it builds resilience and it makes you courageous and it also makes you a really great explorer and a really great collaborator. So what these two kind of mysterious things are, um, a liquid network essentially means that information and knowledge can flow readily. So you don't have an environment that has rigidity or obstruction or knowledge um, hoarding. It means that the environment is such that people are transparent and they're open to sharing so that that can flow back and forth, which actually supports colliding information and makes other things possible. So that means that the network is liquid. Um, and the other thing is generative social spaces. So take a, just a second to read that too. Could you go back to the other slide just for a second? Yeah, absolutely. And also these are all on Flickr, so I'll share my decks with you guys. And you notice that it's individual and collective. So you don't have to lose yourself in the process of collaborating, but you allow other selves, you know? Thank you. Sure. And then this one. This one I love. It's um, in terms of neurobiology, it's actually still mysterious. They don't know how it works, but they just know that it works. So what I have seen in um, well-designed and well-facilitated sessions is that this actually occurs, right? So the boundaries of our own selves kind of soften and we become receptive and interested and available for other people. And 
it's interesting because they, when I say they, I mean the scientists that are studying this phenomenon, because they're, they're looking at the output, so they know that it's something interesting is happening, but they don't know just neurobiologically how it's happening. And so, and so we know how to make it happen, and, but it definitely has something to do with energy in the nervous system, but they don't exactly know. It's kind of beautiful and mysterious, which we like, Roy. Um, Roy and I are both Zen students. Um, so, but we know how you can foster it, and I call it opening the channel, right? So making things available that might otherwise be obstructed. These are some basic things that humans r really uh, naturally know how to do. And these are things that we also know how to do. <laughs> We're like really great at both of these things. And this is not me saying we're bad, you know. We're human beings, and we have reactivity, and we have responsiveness, and it's normal and healthy to understand that. So it's not a condemnation of our natural human behaviors. It's an invitation to wonder about them and to think, oh, wow, this is a massive problem. There was a woman last night that was, she works here at the education school, and she was trying to solve a, a, a sizable problem that involved multiple stakeholders. And so if they want to get a really um, robust and rigorous um, rubric, which was what her end game was, that other people could apply, they're going to have to get skillful at collaborative intelligence. So to me, it's more like an opportunity. It's not like saying, oh, I, I suck at this. I'm just not going to try. It's more like, ooh, where are the places where I could notice my conduct or notice how I'm um, collapsing myself or contracting or making other people contract? Because you have a shared goal, and you're trying to support each other mutually. So when you go back to these places, right? So this is how I, um, when I find myself doing the thing where I'm like overanalyzing or something, um, I just notice it. And then I'm like, OK, I'm going to, even if it's just a breath, drop back into wondering, questioning, and so forth. And it really is an ongoing practice. It is not something you master. It's, it's lifetimes and maybe many lifetimes. But when you are motivated by mutual success, it helps a lot because you can come back to the space, right? So this is what I want y'all to practice with each other in this design thinking game. How, what's going on now? What are y'all thinking? Somebody tell me a thought. It doesn't have to be like mind blowing, just a thought. Hopeful. You're hopeful? Oh, see, mm -hmm. <laughs> girl, yeah. What else is going on? <laughs> she was <laughs> oh no like the standard's super high and now you got to be like an illuminated being or something <laughs> uh, that's understood thank you for sharing that because um i think a lot of us have that effect like where we suddenly feel bad like oh no i'm not good at these things and so and i i'm i struggle with these too and i do this for a living right i mean do you know how annoying the people i work with are <laughs> i have to constantly be like okay okay Okay, okay, you know, and then come back. Man, it's hard. That's one of the things about Zoom, because you can like just turn the thing off and be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like seriously. But the cool thing about visual thinking is that it actually has this like effect on groups where they're focusing on that piece, and they start. It it stops becoming about us being the the smartest person in the room, and it really becomes about the activity. And that's why I put these two together. Because it's like, we're, we're not, none of us are like, you know, therapists or Mother Teresa. Like, we're just natural people and we have fears and concerns. So when you put attention on a visual thinking experience, it changes that, like, right out of the gate. So that's cool. And you cannot fail this exercise. <laughs> I'm not grading you. I promise you that. Um, and I think, uh, hopefully, it will just be a little sampling of how you could approach problems using visual thinking and some of these other methods. And I'll leave... I'll leave this slide up if you want to like just go back to it when you're working. Um, so this game is called Bubble Doodling. I wish I invented it, but I didn't. This amazing guy named John Paul Lederach, he's a um, conflict transformation uh, professor. And so he does wonderful system thinking maps, systems thinking maps. And he is the one who invented this game. And I was like, bubble doodling, like, hello, that's my jam. So um, we're friends now. But um, I, he did a presentation recently and said this, and I thought it was very moving. Right? So like, 
it's not even it's not even about blaming a person. It's like these are system dynamics. So the question then becomes, how do you see the system? How do you externalize the system? How do you find the mental model that one person has and compare it to the mental model that another person has so that it's not about us being bad or wrong. It's really about what, what keeps showing up in the sequel of this movie. Like, what are the dynamics here? And so, because once you start to externalize it, then you have leverage, then you have an opportunity. So that's what I wanted to do is like, and he calls it bubble doodling. So what I want to do is y'all are going to work in pairs. Um, and it really, uh, it will be a rich conversation, but it won't be, it's not complicated. Like you'll be able to definitely pull it off. So here's an example. Don't you worry, you've got this, <laughs> you've got this. So here's an example, and this is actually a completed bubble doodle. And so we're looking for a vicious cycle or a, you know, a non-virtuous cycle inside of any system. It can be like your family or your work life or the world, it doesn't matter, you get to pick. But so you wanna find an observable condition to improve. Okay, and this is actually the one that John Paul gave, so this is not me talking about where I work, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, the, an observable condition you want to improve, okay? So, the pluses and minuses mean increase or decrease. So, so in this completed bubble doodle, you have the observable condition, fear of boss, which decreases open disagreement, right? Which decreases direct communication, which increases in group out group and back channeling behavior, which increases the uncertainty and confidence of the boss, which increases her tendency to exert control, which increases fear of boss, right? Like it's a little too familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I did not make this one up. So that's the, the game here is to figure out, you're going to work in pairs, and one of you is going to be the listener, and the other person is going to be the, um, the storyteller. So one of you has to find the, the, and it can be imaginative. It doesn't have to be. If you don't want to go like, you know, authentically with your stuff, that's cool. You can make one up, but it's better if you do a real one because then you actually will see it differently and you might see a perspective that you didn't have otherwise. And what, ha what will happen in between is the other person is responsible for listening to you talk and then creating the circles and then adding that content inside of the circles. And you don't, this is the final version, right? So there's gonna be a lots of messy circles on your pages and you're gonna start situating them until you discover a cycle that needs to be non-habituated. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. And what's so nice is the person who's listening and, and capturing, so your job is the yes anding. So, so not saying, oh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. I mean, you can say it internally, it's gonna happen, but you don't wanna convey that. Like, I mean, it's just, we're just, we're so messy humans. We're just a, a, a shit mess. So um, I cussed again, I told you, stop um, letting me. Um, so it's my love language. I was talking about that last night. Um, Oh, yeah, so, and then, you, and so curiosity, yes anding, and turn taking. So you can ask clarifying questions, you can try to sort of help them parse it, but don't doubt what they're saying, don't obstruct what they're saying, you know, don't be skeptical about what they're saying, just let what they're saying be true, because it is true for them, okay?